With us today is Nancy Free, Chief Compliance and Data Privacy Officer, and Marilyn Mendola, Head of Indications and Warning. With more than 20 years of experience in IT and internal audits, Nancy is a trusted advisor for Armour's partners and clients on GDPR, PCI, HIPAA, and financial services regulations. Marilyn has more than 10 years of experience in cybersecurity and previously served as a cyber engineer at Raytheon in information assurance, certification and accreditation, and secure cloud architecture. With that, Marilyn, I'll turn this over to you and we can get started. All right, thank you, Rachel. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I am very excited to be here today with Nancy and all of you to discuss women in cybersecurity. This topic has certainly been receiving a lot of attention recently and with good reason. There is a global shortage of trained cybersecurity professionals, women, who historically have been largely underrepresented in this industry make up a large talent pool that we can be tapped to help fill the industry ranks. Having more women in cybersecurity also means more diversified backgrounds, perspectives, and experiences to solve today's challenging cybersecurity problems. The threat actors we pursue have a wide variety of backgrounds and experiences. So we as an industry need to follow suit in order to put up our very best defense. While there is much that can be said on this topic, our discussions today will focus on three areas, the cybersecurity skills shortage, ways to develop your cybersecurity skills, and methods to increase employee, employee recruitment and retention. All right, that's enough intro. Let's, um, there's so much for us to cover, so let's go ahead and dive right in. Let's first look at the cybersecurity skills shortage and see how women are essential to helping solve this problem. The cybersecurity skill shortage is reportedly one of the biggest challenges today for IT security decision makers, as we face not only a shortage of industry professionals, but also a shortage of trained industry professionals. Here at Armour, I struggle finding trained security analysts to join my team. We, like many other businesses, have specific needs. Our analysts must be jack of all trades, so to speak. They need system administration experience, networking experience. They also need strong security foundations, and if we're lucky, they have SOC analyst experience already and experience working with our security tools. So that's a pretty long list of needs. And so I continue to struggle to find trained candidates for the job. That's why when I'm looking to hire L1 or entry-level talent, I usually forego a lot of those needs for the right candidate, focusing more on transferable skills, which we will discuss in a bit, and a solid culture fit. But that means that my team and I are making a substantial investment in these candidates to shore up their knowledge gaps. So how bad is this shortage? Well, according to a Frost and Sullivan report from 2017, there will be a projected 1.8 million unfilled jobs in cybersecurity by 2020 worldwide. That's an incredible amount of unfilled opportunities within a single industry. And why are women such an important solution to this problem? Well, we represent roughly half the world's population, and yet we only represent 11% of the total cybersecurity professionals. And that's according to a 2013 ISC Squared Global Information Security Workforce Study. 11%. Why is this number so low? And what is keeping women away from this field? So let's dive into that next. Even though it's a bit dated, this 11% statistic from 2013 surprised me when I first heard it. I've worked with plenty of women in this industry, so I've never really felt that we women were underrepresented. But when I reflected further on my experiences, focusing specifically on details in this slide, I could see the underrepresentation a bit more clearly. I've had only one female supervisor thus far in my career. I've worked with many women leaders, program managers, operations, marketing leaders, and the like, but only one so far in my direct management chain. Most of the authors and presenters of the cybersecurity blogs and webinars that I have been exposed to have, in fact, been men. In entertainment, I feel that the majority of the cybersecurity movie and TV show characters are mostly portrayed by men. Looking back at the last technical conference that I attended, our keynote speaker was a woman, but all presenters and most of the attendees were men. I mean, check out the top Google image search results for the word cybersecurity posted on the right side of this slide. 
all men. And yes, I would argue that two uh, that those two images with the human silhouettes are quite manly looking. So to be clear though, we women may be underrepresented, but we are not underappreciated. I have never held a position in this industry in which I felt underappreciated, undervalued, or felt that my gender was negatively impacting my career growth. My managers, most of the men, have always helped, supported, and pushed me to grow professionally. I do not want anyone listening to view this underrepresentation as an obstacle or even as a deterrent for joining this field. If you're interested in cybersecurity, that is fantastic. Come join us. What about you, Nancy? What have your experiences been like so far as a woman in cybersecurity? Well, I've seen a lot of the same things you have, Marilyn, and I'm also bothered by the Google image search that shows only men when you're searching for cybersecurity. So I can also say I am not at all surprised. I've spent the last 28 years in assorted professional roles, and 24 of those specifically focused on technology, security and privacy, and compliance or assurance roles. Thinking back to all the roles that I've held in different industries, I spent the first 16 of those 24 years having never encountered a woman in a leadership role. 16 years, that is astounding. I can't count the number of meetings that I sat through where I was the only woman in the room, and I'm not the most outspoken woman you're allowed to meet. I mean, it is much more natural for me to analyze a conversation that's going on around me and to ask questions at the end when I feel like I have enough information to form my own perspe perspective and give my own opinion. Um, but I often found that, that was not how the men operated. They were more of a rapid fire Q&A, and uh, what I saw more often than not, uh, their delivery was more, uh, I, I'll, I'll just say it was enough to make the strongest man crumble under the pressure. It was, it was pretty remarkable to see. Um, it's not to put all men into that bucket by any means. I've Definitely worked with a lot of men who were encouraging and supportive teammates. Unfortunately, they were just not the men being promoted into the leadership roles in the companies that I worked for. And what woman, in her right mind, is signing up for that? I mean, <laughs> let's be real. You're, you're, you're not exactly lining up for some abuse like that. Uh, so fast forward a bit. Uh, 2007, that was when I encountered my very first woman leader in a technical role. She was the CIO at a home builder I was working for, and she was amazing. I'd never seen a woman lead a room full of mostly men in such a powerful yet non-abusive way. Uh, I found myself taking notes on how she approached conflict, how and when she raised questions to the group, how she physically sat at the table and took up her space in the room. I mean, I wasn't watching her like creepy stalker kind of watches, you know, but I just wanted to learn everything that I could learn so that I could hope to move into increasingly more challenging roles. And that worked. I've continued to encounter strong women leaders since. They are CIOs, CISOs, and CTOs. They lead IT audit and assurance programs. They identify threats and protect organizations and do all of it with ever-increasing efficiency and grace. It makes me very proud to be a woman in cyber. I think it's very hard, actually, for women to consider a path when the only leaders that she sees are men, whether that be in the companies that they work for, at the security or technology conferences that you were mentioning, or even in their classroom. Looking back at most, there were two other girls in my programming classes, and by contrast, there were no more than one or two boys in my typing classes. Now, for those of you who are too young to remember typing classes, these were the uh, classes that they put all the girls into to make sure that we were going to be efficient uh, secretaries for the men who would ultimately be our boss, and thank God that time has shifted. The good news is, as a whole, things are getting better. The 11% figure continues to appear in the media despite a substantial rise in the number of women in the cybersecurity field. And this is perpetuating the stigma that too few women are in cyber. In Security Boulevard's recent article, they believe women constitute 24% of the cybersecurity workforce. That is a much better story. In Forrester's article titled, Cybersecurity faces old familiar foes, costly new attacks, and welcome leadership changes. Beyond the geopolitical trends and the escalation of cyber espionage and sabotage issues, they predict that the number of women in CISO roles will increase in 2019 as companies look for those different perspectives. They're predicting 20% of CISO roles will be filled by women, 
which is up from only 13% in 2017. This is due to the fact that the security industry has realized they've been ignoring half of the population. Companies are now expanding their search for talent to be more inclusive. Forrester recommends that companies start by implementing targeted hiring goals for women and focus recruiting efforts on groups with more diversity. Women in technology, compliance, legal or risk roles should be considered the next potential CISO for your organization, sustaining a culture of acceptance, inclusion, and mentorship that holds on to top talent. Cybersecurity Ventures agrees that there is an alarmingly low percentage of women in security positions. Their research predicts that women will represent more than 20% of the global cybersecurity workforce by the end of 2019. These numbers are still low, to be sure, but with heightened awareness led by numerous women in cyber associations and with initiatives, the needle is moving in a positive direction. It also helps to realize that IT security is only a subset of cybersecurity. Beyond securing corporate networks, we must consider IoT security, medical device security, automotive cybersecurity, aviation cybersecurity, and military cyber defense technologies within the scope of cyber. Even beyond that are the roles in risk management, compliance and privacy, audit and assurance. Without looking at the bigger picture, it's easy to conclude that women are barely represented in cyber, and that is sending the wrong message to young girls who may want to be pursuing an education or future career in our field. It's time to start sending out a new and accurate message about the number of women in cybersecurity. There is more opportunity than ever before. The Cybersecurity Ventures report predicts that there will be 3.5 million cybersecurity jobs by 2021. Let me say that number again. 3.5 million cybersecurity jobs before 2021. I'm very excited about this because my kids will be coming out of school around that time and they will all be hopefully going into careers in cybersecurity. <laughs> to fill these world's open security positions, we'll need to aim for 50% of women in cyber over the next decade. We'll need to encourage more girls to pursue cybersecurity degrees, to join women-focused cybersecurity groups, and to take advantage of the many free learning resources and opportunities that are available online. The information is there. The industry just needs women to step up. So how do we do that? Let's talk about getting your foot in the cybersecurity door and developing your skill set. I recently hosted an event attended by women in all walks of cybersecurity and asked the participants why they entered the cybersecurity field and to tell me about the coolest project they'd ever worked on. The answers were as diverse as the women providing them. In terms of why they moved into this industry, they told me things like, I love solving challenging problems and I get to build products from the ground up. I absolutely love the feeling of helping companies keep hackers and cyber criminals away and consumer data safe. And with projects like securing chips in U.S. passports, working with Interpol, and building e-commerce applications, it was clear that these women, had found their, these women had found their passion in cybersecurity. Marilyn, what can you tell us about your path to cyber? Well, Nancy, I had a slow start into cybersecurity. There was no cybersecurity degree when I went to college, at least not in my school. And so I was exposed only a little bit to cyber-related uh, cyber topics when I was getting my bachelor's in computer engineering. Even so, that small exposure was enough to grab my interest. Unfortunately, after graduation, I wasn't able to get into a security-focused job right away. I had no work experience under my belt. And using my degree as experience, I could only get hired on as an entry-level software engineer. I knew this wasn't my desired career path, so I immediately discussed my interest in cybersecurity with my manager at the time, and within one year, I was able to transition to a cybersecurity position within the company. What about your journey, Nancy? Well, my path was not direct either. Full transparency, my early life goals were just to be a wife and a mother. I was always very good at math and science in school, but I didn't have some burning desire to be anything else. As it happened, 90 days into a new company, my boss left suddenly and I was half promoted into her role. I say half promoted because I got all the responsibility and duties, I just did not get any title or pay. 
At the time, I was too new to question uh, or care about such things. I was just thrilled that the partners in the firm had that kind of faith in me. Uh, I didn't really know much about the role, but I had an analytical mind and I liked to solve problems, and I was determined not to mess anything up. So I studied everything I could to keep from embarrassing myself, honestly. My next job had me running a help desk, writing scripts and user manuals, administering networks and databases, and performing QA testing and more. Uh, just so you know, small firms require everyone wear a lot of hats, uh, and that was certainly the case in some of the jobs that I held. The next job included email and web administration and project management. The common theme here in all of these roles was to have a plan or a process for all the work and obviously never to stop learning. Then came the security and compliance roles, and for the first time, I wasn't just taking a role to keep up the hustle. My job motivation was security, job security, if nothing else. Uh, and regulators honestly gave me that in spades. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, became law in 1996, and that was followed by Sarbanes-Oxley Act in 2002. And in these regulations, I found a niche where my process skills, writing skills, and technical skills all merged. I'm still driven to learn, and there are always new regulations to oversee how companies do business, how they protect sensitive data, et cetera. But to sum all this up, for me, cybersecurity or technology weren't specific drivers, but my skills easily transferred into a career that I love. As you can see, my path into cybersecurity differed from Nancy's, and I'm willing to bet it differs from yours, too. What's important is that we are all here recruiting others to join and supporting each other along the way. For those of you listening that haven't quite found your way into cybersecurity yet, that's okay too. The next few slides are tailored to providing you advice on how to get your foot in the door. When I transitioned from a software engineer to security engineer, I had zero security experience and only one year of technical experience under my belt. I was nervous that my experience, or lack thereof, would prevent me from getting the job, but I quickly realized that the focus of the interview was not on what I knew, but on how I learned new things and how I worked through problems. So at Armour, I hire L1 analysts with zero security work experience, much in the same way. I focus heavily on the soft or transferable skills listed on this slide. Problem solving and critical thinking. I like to know how you tackle problems how you think through them, and how you derive your conclusions. Having an inquisitive mind will drive you towards success in this field. The attention to detail, as they say, the devil is in the details. When we review security alerts, one log event can change the outcome of an investigation. So we have to make sure we review all of the details and interpret the findings correctly. Ability to follow methodology and process. For security investigations, often you have to look under many rocks and try to piece together the details of an issue or compromise. And overlooking one piece of information can lead to mistakes with heavy consequences. It can lead to an incorrect conclusion, it can lead to improper or incomplete cleanup, and possibly lead to reinfection. Simply put, skipping steps leads to all the bad things that we want to avoid. Analytical thinking. We receive many events from many security tools within our environment, that are correlated to tell a story. So it's important to be able to understand what each of these events mean and how they play together. So what does a firewall or IDS intrusion detection system or malware event mean within the scope of the investigation? And be able to break those events down to IOCs or indicators of compromise and other information tidbits to help understand and review the event completely. So the last transferable skill is a bit more technical but a background in networking or system administration is a must for this field. So if you already bring this to the table, your learning curve in cybersecurity will be a lot less steep. In addition to transferable skills, there's a lot of great training resources that can be leveraged to grow your skills, many of which are completely free. So why not take advantage? We highlight a few of these resources here. The first is CyberA.IT. This provides training videos and other resources for many certifications, compliance regulations, and general cybersecurity topics. The majority of these materials are completely free. I personally use the CISSP training course offered freely on the site to prepare for my exam. My analysts have used the CompTIA training resources on the site with great success. 
The next IT Pro TV, I believe, does require a subscription, but it also provides a wide range of training courses, including AWS, CompTIA, EC Council, Six Sigma, and so much more. There's a free trial option, so you can try before you buy. The last are podcasts. Now, these are very popular. Their format is short, sweet, very fitting for our busy lives. There are many great cybersecurity-focused podcasts. I've asked my coworkers for their suggestions and were turned on to some pretty good ones. I usually listen to podcasts on my drive in to work. I find that they help get my mind ready for my day. Sans Daily Stormcast and the latest hacking news are both very short and easy to digest. Both have frequent, if not daily, episodes that are under 10 minutes long. Some others that I listen to, like Paul Security Weekly and the Cyberwire, are longer sometimes really long and last over an hour, and these typically do a deep dive on a topic with guests from different sectors within the industry. There's one more that I'll mention. Down the Security Rabbit Hole is hosted by Armor's own Rafal Los, our VP of Solutions Strategy. These podcasts take a business perspective on the cybersecurity world. They usually have several episodes a month and typically run between 30 to 45 minutes per episode. Again, there is a plethora of information out there in a variety of ingestible formats. So get out there, test the waters, and find the information that interests you the most, present it in a manner that works for you the best, and start getting your learning on. Next, let's talk about certifications. Certifications are also a great way to build your cybersecurity foundation or hone your existing cybersecurity skill set. There are so many certification paths to choose from. If you're asking yourself, where do I start? Maybe this will help. I regularly review job listings for cybersecurity jobs in my area for two reasons. Number one, I want to make sure I'm keeping my skill set current with the industry needs. And number two, I want to make sure that I have and maintain pertinent industry certs. Certifications cost you money and time. So it's definitely important that you get the certs that you, that will be the most useful to you in your career. If you're wondering what those might be, go find job regs that interest you and see what certifications those companies require or list as nice to have. That should give you a good starting point. Also, leverage your network. Ask your mentor and colleagues what certifications they have and which they have found most useful to them. I built my security foundation with CompTIA Security Plus. I studied for it the moment I was hired into my first cybersecurity-focused job, and it provided me a solid foundation without diving too deep in the technical weeds. It's an inexpensive self-study course. SAN certifications offer very focused and technical training. The training is typically instructor-led, so the cost can be higher compared to other industry certs. CISSP and CISM are great professional certifications. They focus on cybersecurity training for industry leaders. Again, these are just a few options that we wish to highlight. There are many certification options out there, so be sure you do your research and you choose the ones that are right for you. Next, let's talk about professional organizations. So joining an industry organization provides several benefits. Internships and job opportunities, exposure to industry conferences, you can get discounted rates to attend, you can have opportunities to present. Uh, There are networking benefits, building your your professional network, finding mentors, finding SMEs or subject matter experts, finding champions that can help you progress through your career path. And lastly, education benefits. They help you stay current with industry news and changes. Here are a few uh, organizations that we'd like to highlight. Girls Who Code. This organization focuses on getting girls interested in computer science early on because they found that the biggest drop of girls participating in computer science happens between the ages of 13 and 17. So that is the age range that they target. Women in Cybersecurity. This is a national organization that brings women in cybersecurity together from academia, research, and industry to share knowledge, experience, networking, and mentoring. They hold a yearly conference, the last of which had half of their attendees registered as students seeking employment opportunities. ISSA, Information Systems Security Association, 
This is an international organization focused on promoting a secure digital world through education forums, publications, and peer interactions. ISC Squared, again, another international organization focused heavily on educating both industry professionals through certifications and the public. So while there are many great cybersecurity organizations that operate at international and national levels, there are also great local ones too. So check out what's in your area and get involved. Just a few more tidbits as we wrap up the developing your cyber skills section. I've had great success with these, even though some were very challenging for me to do. So first is cast your net wide. You may not be able to get your dream job right from the start. I didn't, but experience in any IT, software, or general tech role will provide great knowledge and training for this industry. If you're the smartest person in the room, it's time for you to find another room. And this is especially true early on in your career. You want to make sure you surround yourself with seasoned professionals so you can benefit and learn from their experiences. It's always okay to say, I don't know. I know that can be hard for some people to do. It's hard for me to do. I'd say that the important thing is what you do next. Confidence is important, and I struggle with this one especially when I find myself starting a new role or taking on new and challenging responsibilities. I give myself pep talks constantly and I power pose before meetings. It may sound silly, but it definitely helps. Last, find your champion. Find someone who values your efforts, your work ethic, your accomplishments, and makes them known to other professionals and leaders within your company and in the industry. We'll talk about mentorship in a little bit, but finding your champion is just as important as seeking a mentor. So what can we do to increase employee recruitment and retention? Let's start with recruitment. When there are job requisitions you are looking to fill, target industry associations that focus on women and security. We mentioned a few of those earlier, like the Women in Security Special Interest Group of the North Texas ISSA, Women's Society of Cyber Jutsu, and the DFW ATW, but there are many, many more. These groups are filled with diverse, qualified candidates that you should be talking to. Think also that women know other women, and our networks are ever-growing. By talking to the women in your organization and possibly offering incentives for employee referral bonuses, you can cut through a sea of resumes and get down to the women who are known and proven in their fields. That's a win for everybody. And remember that skills are easier to teach than attitude. And when conducting interviews, be sure to include women in the hiring process. A hiring committee that is not diverse can hardly be expected to make your workforce more diverse. In, in terms of retention, develop a mentor program. By connecting employees who want to learn how to navigate their careers with those who have done so with some degree of success, you build a more confident, focused workforce. Some of my best mentors have been men who helped me to see areas where I was approaching different situations, like a girl, if you will, uh, between working in male-dominated fields like cybersecurity in male-dominated industries like industry and transportation, their counsel has made the world of difference in how I communicate with men and women alike. I still communicate in a way that's true to me, but now my words land in the way I want them to, regardless of the audience. Create opportunities for your employees to shine and recognize them when they do. Consider that your team members want to continue to learn and grow throughout their careers. And when you encourage leaders to provide visibility into their teams and their work, you showcase growth opportunities within your company. And who doesn't want their team striving to be more than they were yesterday? It's also a great opportunity to toot the horn of your top performers who may be reluctant to make their own accomplishments visible to a large audience. Focus on policies that promote good work-life balance. I will tell you that I'm not a big believer in the expression work-life balance because the term implies that work and life deserve equal time and attention, that day-to-day -day you maintain a balance between the two. I don't feel that that's very realistic, realistic and it does put undue stress and pressure on women who are trying to achieve this nirvana. 
there will always be times when your life, be it you, your health, your family, whatever, will require more of your attention. And work will have its share of emergencies that will take you away from those that you love. The key is to find that healthy mix of all of these things so that you can manage all that's being asked of you as a human. It's easier to do when your employer has policies that are flexible and supportive. At Armour specifically, we have the option of unlimited paid time off. Time is still approved by management, of course, like you would expect, but this policy allows employees to worry less about taking time off when their child is sick, again, or when they simply need a break. You take what you need and you manage your life. That's what it's all about. Finally, start a women's group in your company. We've done this at Armour and have only success stories to tell. The Armour Women's Network seeks to create connectivity across the business and provide professional development and career opportunities. Our goal is to accelerate Armour's attraction, retention, and development of talented women to contribute to Armour's growth and success. We are only 18 months in, and in that time, we've added an additional 37 women to our team with a 92% retention rate. Let that sink in for a minute. It highlights Armour's focus on reducing the gender gap in cybersecurity roles and the success of our program to retain top talent. That's wonderful. Within the AWN, we launched a mentoring program, and 10% of our entire workforce is participating. participating. That number only continues to grow. We arrange quarterly education opportunities, including book clubs, podcast pods, and webinar series on leadership development and many other topics. Working with groups like the North Texas ISSA Women in Security Special Interest Group and other corporate women's groups around the Metroplex, we've connected many women across the cyber landscape. Presentations have included a wide range of topics, including mentoring, gendered negotiations, and personal branding. Our most recent speaker was Lauren Hasten from Developer, whose company also provides many resources to women looking to advance their careers in technology. And she told us her personal story about how she went from having zero network and zero prospects to achieving tremendous recognition in her career and growing a solid global network. An inspiring story, to be sure. And finally, we launched a corporate Toastmasters International Club within Armour. This group represents another 10% of our workforce who are looking to grow leadership and communication skills. Not only are we winning awards, but we've also seen a significant increase in productivity around the office. This is due to the fact that previously siloed teams have a means of coming together in a different way and getting to know one another. That's fantastic. And we've done all this, like I said, in 18 months. So just think what you can do within your organization if you put your mind to it. Perfect. Well, thank you, Nancy and Marilyn, for providing such great insights into the cybersecurity landscape and the impact women are making and continue to make in the industry. At this time, we will transition to the question and answer portion of the webinar. If you've not already submitted your questions, please feel free to use the question function to submit them now. And while you're submitting your questions, I do want to ask all attendees to participate in the quick survey that, we will, um, that will be sent out after the broadcast. And that's where you can provide us with a little bit of your feedback. Also, if you think about a question once the broadcast is closed, you can also submit those questions in that post-broadcast survey as you rate our webinar for the day. And if you'd like to attend any of our other upcoming webinars or see any events that may be in your local area that we will be in attendance at, please feel free to visit and sign up at armor.com slash events. And with that, let's just jump right into the first question. Um, so the first one um, is more specific to Armour, and they're asking, can you talk more about Armour's internship program, what we offer, and how would I apply if I want to be part of that program? Sure. Um, so Armour, all the different teams across Armour have the opportunity to look for interns. Usually they would be summer interns, um, and at any point in time that we decide that that's an area that we want to look to, we would post those requisitions on our website, so definitely go to armor.com and look for the career section. Uh, I'd say April and May would be the best, best time frame to find opportunities for summer internships. Perfect. Wonderful. And then who, I know you talked a lot about the Armor Women's Network and just the success that you've had with that, but who ends up running that, that network? Is it an HR initiative? Is it a different department? How do you guys actually run in our success? Sure. Okay. Um, well, actually, our chief marketing officer, Diana Massaro, is the executive sponsor of the group. 
uh, and our budget does come from the HR department. Uh, coordination of events and speakers is something that I oversee, and then the ideas for future speakers or educational topics come from all the women of Armour. It's truly a collaborative effort. Wonderful, wonderful. So have you had any, um, have you had to overcome any big challenges as women in cybersecurity? And if so, how did you overcome them? So I'd like to field this question. Um, I've overcome several challenges as a career-driven woman. Um, I'd like to share two of my toughest challenges uh, right now. So several months ago, I accepted a leadership role at Armour. And a short time afterward, I ran into my mentor in the hall, and she's a woman and a leader here at the company. And she pulled me aside and told me that my body language and my tone made me look timid and unconfident, and that just completely floored me. Um, as a new leader, I just, I mean, that's not the impression that I wanted to make. I never considered how my bad posture, which to be fair, I don't think it was that bad, but apparently it was. <laughs> um, but I never considered how my posture was affecting my image within the company. And my posture was speaking for me, quote unquote, and apparently it wasn't saying good things. So I told myself, that's not acceptable. Uh, and since then, I remind myself every day to carry myself in a way that, um, you know, projects confidence because as a leader, I need my team and also my peers to see me as such. Uh, my second struggle is a bit more personal, but it's also one that I feel that many w working women also face. Uh, I recently became a working mom. My son is nine months old, and I, can, I just continue to struggle with balancing work life and mom life. Um, I found it tough to keep my career on track while also making sure that, you know, I wasn't missing out on any precious moments at home. Um, I've talked to other women, other w working women uh, to get advice, and um, that's, a, that's helped me tremendously. But honestly, I think knowing that I wasn't alone in the struggle has, has really helped me the most. Wonderful, wonderful. So the next question actually kind of goes back to getting started in the cybersecurity field, and it says, you mentioned more universities are offering classes and degree programs in cybersecurity, which is awesome. I can tell you, you know, being in school six, seven years ago that, that they weren't offered to seeing that growth just happen is, is so great. But from y'all's perspective and having been in the industry um, with your experience, what are some of the most reputable programs that you guys are seeing? Well, thinking about North Texas specifically, I know that the uh, University of North Texas has been nationally recognized for their program in cybersecurity. Uh, and the University of Texas at Dallas has also gained a good reputation in this space. Uh, as far as master's programs goes, I've met and worked with quite a few of the graduates from the University of Dallas master's in cybersecurity program. Uh, they are definitely worth a look. Perfect, perfect. And our last one, which I think it is one of the toughest one, toughest questions um, in the sense of it is just completely relatable for all women um, going into any workforce in any industry is any advice when it comes to salary negotiation? Uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. I struggle with salary negotiations. Um, I think it's because I find it hard to put into words my worth to a business. Um, but, I mean, I've done a few negotiations and I'm happy to report that. I mean, it just keeps getting easier with time and experience, so hang in there. Um, so here's what I like to focus on when, when I go into salary negotiations. So number one, I do my research and I know my market value, right? And so I focus on, you know, my education, my certifications, my years of experience, and, and more importantly, how closely my experience aligns with the job requirements. Um, and then secondly, I, I just make sure I can explain with like specific examples my worth to the business. So again, you want to focus on like your experiences, accomplishments, your soft and your technical skills, all that is important. Uh, the next thing I want to mention, and this can be a big challenge, at least it is for me, um, I, I, I check my emotions at the door, right? And I make sure that I only bring information that's pertinent to myself, uh, it's pertinent to my experiences and my performances when I go to the negotiation table. Um, it's also helpful to lean on your champions and your mentors, you know, we've, as we've discussed in the webinar, uh, for help and advice uh, through a salary negotiation process. Um, but, you know, in the end, I think it's important to just be strong, be decisive, and ask for what you believe you deserve. Because, honestly, it just never hurts to ask. I would actually add on to that as well. Um, when you're looking at roles, consider what the role is always actually going to do to your 
your work in life situation? Is this going to be something that's going to take you away from your family consistently? Is it something that's going to be a job where you're working, you know, 18 hours a day? Uh, if it is, you know, even if maybe your past salary history has not supported it, ask for that additional money because this is going to affect your life in a different way. You should be compensated for it. Uh, also, make sure you you get something. I mean, any employer is going to come in at the lowest possible level, and even a hundred dollar difference in the salary over the course of your career is going to be a tremendous uh, impact. So, you know, don't don't settle for nothing. Go go for any any increase in salary that you can get right from the beginning. You won't be regretting it. At. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. These were such great questions. Thank you, everyone, for submitting them. Nancy and Marilyn, I'd like to thank you for joining us on today's broadcast and sharing your expertise with our attendees. And sincere so thank you to everyone that joined us today. And remember to fill out our post-broadcast survey so we can help improve any of our future webinars. And we look forward to hosting you on our next event. Thanks so much.